Hello. Welcome. Welcome to our three micro sessions about indie arcades and events. Um, my name is Yon. I have Zoraida and Marie. Um, Zoraida is going to kick off by giving a short history and, or overview of playful culture and events. And Marie will talk about her activities in the Wild Rumpus, and I'm going to round it off with uh, some of my experience in building arcades and uh, going to these events. So, yeah. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, my name is Sarita Buter. I'm, uh, um, I have my own company called Zoe, and I am co-founder of Playful Arts Festival in the Netherlands, and I'm a worldwide co-director of the Global Game Jam. One of the things that I've been doing in the past few years is uh, organizing events uh, to bring people together, to connect them, and uh, give them a sense of uh, community uh, for different kind of purposes. Uh, for example, I set up uh, in 2010, I set up uh, in the Netherlands Indigo Showcase, which is a showcase for game developers, Dutch game developers, to show their games to each other, but also to um, to a different audience, um, audience that normally never go to game events, and show show them what kind of games are made in the Netherlands. And we did that by using these arcade cabinets uh, that give a more of an exhibit feel than a, a messy, um, different kinds of PCs and stuff like that that you normally, or which you usually saw but with um, uh, um, game exhibits. So we try to use these, and you can actually see them as well in. Uh, uh, at GDC or at Gamescom this um, this week at the Holland Pavilion and booth number B030. Uh, another event I started last year was the Playful Arts Festival, which is a festival where we try to connect people from different kinds of uh, audiences uh, together and have them play to get together. Like uh, So join us, um, um, come us together with the uh, uh, spectacle games, uh, bring you toe-to-toe -to -toe and head-to-head -head with your friends, collaborate, play, sneak, team up. So we, we try to get people together and, and play, play with each other so they could mix and mingle and uh, experience new things. Like you can s see here that you have Hit Me, uh, which is more of a physical game, and then other games like um, um, Mega Gerb or Hokra. We also brought the Play for Arts Festival to uh, an art fair in the Netherlands in Rotterdam, where we try to give new audiences new experiences um, like this game um, and put them in an art fair, which is a different place than what uh, games would normally be experienced in the Netherlands, for at, le at least. And then in um, last year, I organized Day in the Park in the Netherlands. And it was actually meant to take place in the park, but it was pouring down. So we decided to do it inside and get people together and play more folk games um, and games that you used to do on the playground. And you can see how, uh, how this makes people smile in, in this setting and get them a little bit closer together than what they normally uh, would do. And you can see here a little bit of uh, lemon jousting going on in the middle of the Dutch game garden. So uh, Eric Zimmerman um, t said in the introduction to game design, the 21st century will be a century of play. Game designers will be the architects, the storytellers, and the party hosts of this playful new world. So how is this done? Um, I think play is uh, a kind, couple of things are part of play and playful culture, and, and, and according to me, which is there's a certain sense of participation. People have to participate to make things happen. There's a sort of performance uh, going on um, with, and, and the spectatorship, which helps this performance. And then encounter, and encounter can be uh, getting together, but also experience uh, and encounter new games and be curious about it. So this happens around the world in, in different kinds of places through uh, game makers, people that make games, um, events that happen worldwide, um, public space, in public space or in a certain space, and collectives that make stuff like this. For example, games. And games can be folk games like this, or local multiplayer games, which you can see here, or performative games like Hit Me from Kao Abe. Um, Ramiro Cobetta is a game designer, and um, he was asked uh, what he's doing, and he said, 
I focus a lot on making games um, that bring people together. So this is so he's interested in social behavior and um, interactions between different people. And a whole bunch of people and events and collectives do this in, uh, in the world. And it started, well, it didn't start, but you can see here an overview of a couple of events that were of, and collectives that were starting this, like Kokoromi in 2006. And then um, it all, well, these are kind of events and collectives that are doing this throughout the world. And what's interesting about this is that they're all inspired by each other. So when I asked uh, in a mailing list, why did you start doing this? Then they were um, answering with things like um, Kokoromi and baby costs were happening and we wanted to have something like this as well. Um, and this can be in the UK, but also in Argentina and in Sweden and in Australia. So baby costs is mentioned a lot. And baby costs is this underground collective in New York. And they had a mission of bringing things to a larger audience. As you can see here, either through do-it-do-it-yourself arcades or getting them together and showcase these arcades um, and get people to play which normally wouldn't maybe not do, but um, they were just pulled into the whole playing experience, sometimes literally by having this thing surrounding them. Uh, Douglas Wilson, creator of, um, of Johan Sebastian Jau, says that there is a lot of ground to be explored between the intersection between games and more experience-based creative traditions. And you can see what he did, before, for example, with Johan Sebastian Joost. As we are now in uh, Europe, I was um, looking to see what kind of stuff is happening in Europe. And there's a whole bunch of there out there, like the Indie Games Arcade at Eurogamer brings uh, games to um, an, an indie games to uh, uh, an audience, a triple A audience normally. Uh, Game City in the UK, for example, who um, tries to experiment with new kinds of events. Um, like, like this, for example, um, <clears throat> a maze in uh, in Berlin where they try to have in Indie Connect, where they put things up like this and uh, try to have um, graffiti on the wall. But also, this is a little bit an example of the exp um, of the uh, uh, exhibition, <laughs> and also pop up events like this. Like the Niflis dance, what's happening there? And I br uh, we brought it also to Croatia, for example, beach game jams. Uh, Wild Rumpus and Marie is going to talk about. Then the Wood Festival in Copenhagen is happening. Um, and then um, uh, where these kind of people are, you see the joy in their faces. Uh, and it's a new festival that's going to take place next year again. And then, um, then it's not only game events, but also in the theater, stuff like this is happening. Like... Uh, co what Coney is doing, um, they try to um, have it, have people experience new adventures uh, in the theater and outside the theater and use these theater aspects of it. So there's a lot of stuff happening in, out there and um, we try to engage, uh, Chad Toprak and me try to engage new, uh, all these uh, curators and collectives in, in, in conversation with each other. So we have the new game salon, which is a hangout, uh, a bi-weekly hangout, which he started recently. And if you want to know more of these things that are happening everywhere, I set up a Tumblr where I collect all these videos for uh, a playful culture, uh, which you can see, have a look here. So this was my talk for now. Thank you so much. They asked us to take the questions at the end outside because we're short on time. Sorry. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Maria Zoe. Just sort of uh, mentioned I work as, or I run, help run the World Rumpus, uh, self-titled Queen Roughhouser. Um, I guess sort of I refer to myself as uh, Queen Roughhouser because the, the work that we do or the work that I do running it is sort of very wide and varied, so there's a lot of tasks involved. Um, the World Rumpus is within itself, I guess, sort of, at arcade indie, indie games club night, and I really hate referring to it as a club night because there's something sort of in, inherently sort of 90s and kitsch about that. But I can't really think of a better way to, I guess, sort of phrase events which bring together sort of indie games and alcohol and late night events. And so we run sort of seven events to date, and we predominantly run these in London. But we've also run events sort of as far afield as San Francisco uh, in partnership with. So with Venus Patrol and uh, One Life Left, and we've run events as well on, on a fucking boat. 
Um, so generally this, sort of, oops, generally this sort of stuff that we curate at these events. So the, the selection of games that we present is stuff that we curate. So it tends to be, we started off with the very strict rule of saying, right, it's going to be local, local, local multiplayer games only. And then we accidentally broke that rule by showcasing games such as um, Super Hexagon, which were sort of, okay, well, actually, no, it's competitive single player as well. And then at our GDC event, um, sort of two years ago, we then uh, hosted or presented Proteus, which is the furthest away that you could probably get from local multiplayer and sort of competitive single player games. So when it comes to talking about the games and the events, the games that we show at our events, it's kind of, uh, I guess with the logic of, we kind of know it when we see it, but, um, but yeah. So we've also been branching out sort of in the past year. So this past year at GDC, we also ran um, the Wild Rumpus sort of, uh, Rumpus Royale, which was an indie game sort of world tournament. And we've also worked alongside uh, Venus Patrol and Keita Takahashi's company, Yuvula, to create the game Tenu on Your Teams, which we presented at, uh, at our event or our party last year. So who are the Wild Rumpus? So it's not just myself. I work alongside this uh, ragtag bunch of people who are Dick Hogg and Ricky Haggett, who work to... They work uh, creating the games Ho Hokum and Frobisher Says, and George Buckingham, who you can probably not believe was uh, retros retrospectively photoshopped into that picture afterwards, who is probably best known for creating the game Punch the Custard. Um, so why do we do the events that we do? And I think for me it's that I look around at sort of the events and things that were happening within London at the time when we started World Rumpus, and there were a lot of events which were for sort of indie developers to showcase their work to other indie developers. And there was also a lot of events which were sort of showcasing indie games within sort of larger game expos and sort of established spaces. And I don't want to use the word gamer, but as it's only a seven minute talk, I've got to sort of paraphrase, so I'm going to use that term. But Neither of these spaces were actually places that I felt welcome or I felt that I was really sort of supposed to be in. But as someone who wasn't really a game developer or someone who wasn't really that involved with playing that many sort of AAA games, that I was sort of thinking, well, where do, where do people like me go who are sort of creatively curious about these sort of games to, to run these events? And exactly as Zoe just sort of mentioned in that talk, that I feel like a cliche that we... Um, we were inspired by looking at these photographs of events that were happening elsewhere. So the events that Gamma were putting, or Kokoromi were putting on, and the Gamma events, which you can see here, and the events that Baby Castles were running in New York. And I looked at these spaces, and I looked at these events and the people that were at them, and I could, I could see myself in those places, and it felt like a space where I would be welcomed in the sort of event that I was passionate about recreating and, and running this sort of event. So... We, we sort of took inspiration from those and started setting up our own events. And, and it's kind of interesting listening to sort of Kelly Wallach talking this morning about um, the reason why they don't look at, or when questioned why they don't bring, why they bring the Indie Mega Boots to PAX and they don't look at creating a sort of a separate showcase that is specifically for those games. It's because if they feel that they'll be putting a filter onto the audience that you'd be bringing in. And... I guess sort of the point that I'd all argue is that um, I, it's completely correct that you would be creating a filter, but by running those events at PAX as well, there's still already a filter in place, and it's not a filter that someone like myself sort of passes through quite comfortably. But, um, but also these events like um, the stuff that Baby Castles were doing and that uh, Kokoromi were doing as well, but they weren't just necessarily about sort of creating these sort of neutral spaces. They were spaces which were born out of the creativity and passion of the games that they were showcasing. So for me, when I look at a game like Johann Sebastian Joust, which I, if I have to hold up one game as being the real sort of inspiration for running the events that we do, it is this one. And it's a game that just for me does not equal being showcased necessarily in, in a convention center. Like you can play it there, but for me, playing Johann Sebastian Joust is about being in the hull of an ex-Cold War fishing a ship in the middle of night with sort of this audience of people passionately around the people playing sort of being for blood of the, as they're watching the players engage with their, those games so it's about creating spaces which aren't just sort of neutral spaces for people that are, are sort of outside of or a sort of established games literate audience but it's about creating spaces which are born and sort of sympathetic to the sort of games and work that they're showcasing and so I've just put up here a few sort of the details of the events that we've run to date. So our first event was back in 2011, and uh, that was an event that we ran for, for well, attendance for that was free. And I looked at our budget the other day, and it actually made me laugh because it was about five lines long, and it came to about 400 euros or something for the amount that we spent on it. 
and um, the attendance for that was 300, so it was great that we uh, managed to keep costs down by borrowing a lot of equipment, which does make a lot of extra work for yourself, but there are ways of doing these events and creating and setting these things up and running them at sort of low, low cost, and none of these costs that are up on the screen as well either take into account the time that we work or we, that we do to run these events, that we're doing all of this as a labor of love and we don't pay ourselves to run these, but um, you can then see sort of that we progressed up to sort of GDC, which is a bit of an anomaly because we've kind of got a captive audience out at GDC when we run the parties because there's already a sort of really big, enthusiastic indie games audience there. And, but then coming to sort of the, the most recent event that we did in London, which was, um, as I say, it was on a, on a fucking boat. And that was um, the first event in the UK where we charged entry for because as this audience grows and as we manage to reach these bigger creative audiences that sit outside this sort of games literate sort of audience that of course the costs and we need, a, we need a bigger boat, we need a bigger venue, we need bigger spaces and because of that, that costs money and we want to put on these bigger exhibitions and larger showcases but to do that it costs more money and so we had to put a ticket price on the event and it was great that our attendance was sort of double what it was for the first event but what we did find retrospectively was sort of being at that event is that you could see by the audience who had attended that it wasn't quite the same balance that we'd had for the first event. Instead, that we were kind of missing the people that we'd seen at our first event, which was for free, which we were kind of missing the people that weren't perhaps sort of already in that indie games or sort of games literate space. So I think it's something that retrospectively I want to look back at what ways we can work to potentially still make sure that we're building these events up and we're able to grow with the demand, but also making sure that we remain sort of open, neutral spaces that, that do welcome people from outside of this space to come and realize that, okay, so that they don't, you, you don't feel that you necessarily like games or you don't classify yourself as a gamer, but, but there are things here that you can get passionate about and we need to create events and, and this amazing sense and build this sense of culture and community around these um, things. And one of my favorite quotes that we had for our events was from The Guardian, which was um, this one, which I've highlighted in blue at the bottom, which I'll leave on, which was that uh, our events are a glorious mashup of music, play, and alcohol. Seriously, if you've never caught one of these things, come along and bring lots of people who don't usually play games because their lives are about to change. And, and that's what we want to do. It's like, we want to, we want to introduce more people to this stuff and run more fun and interesting events. So um, if you want to find out more, you can visit uh, theworldrumpus.co.uk or you can find me on Twitter as Tigers Hungry. Thank you. Where's the HDMI cable? Hi, I'll try to make this real quick. I think I have seven minutes. Um, if my computer starts. So, hi, my name is Yon. Um, I made a little bit of a weird presentation. It's an experiment. Please bear with me. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Um, <laughs> please, please hold your claps. Um, I'm going to be saying we a lot, probably. It's because I have a company that's called Glitchnap. I, we're starting up a collective in Antwerp called the House of Indie. Probably, uh, I'm affiliated with the ITU of Copenhagen, uh, where I'm doing, where I, where I have started a student organization that's doing events, and with the Copenhagen Game Collective. Um, let me tell you the story of the last year of my life because that's kind of really related to all of this. It all started when we made this game called Lazy Nights, which was a four-player local multiplayer game we made because we didn't want to write an AI or do level design. Um, <laughs> we were lazy, so it ended up like this, where four people, because obviously you can't play four players on a keyboard because of physical space and hardware limitations, it ended up four people crouching in front of a computer, having a blast, kicking the floor, you know, jumping in the air. But um, yeah, that's not really something you can sell. Uh, but the interesting thing that happened here, oh, this is a tilted thing, this is annoying. I'm just gonna use a touchpad, um, bear with me. Uh, so really quickly, we, we realized that this creates a a space around your game, like a sort of almost physical 
area that you're now playing in with people. Um, but it's really confining to like stand bent over and look at a laptop. Um, so what did we what we did was we put the game in an old arcade machine, you know, like one of those old fridges, and we were able to when we set it up in a public space attract a lot of people because of the familiar shape of a fridge that plays video games. Um, and then we were invited to the Nordic Game Indie Night as a, as a nominee on the one condition, uh, unofficially, the one condition that we would actually bring the arcade machine, um, which was a problem because we didn't actually own that one. We borrowed it from someone. So we decided to build our own, which led to this. Um, with no money and no carpentry skills, we ended up buying two IKEA coffee tables, the cheapest ones you can get, and putting them together, putting a screen in there, and popping out four controllers, uh, which resulted in this. This is my favorite picture. This guy is obviously having a blast. Uh, at playing Laser Knights. Um, we ended up uh, actually winning that award, that, which I think no small part to bringing this arcade because we just dom dominated the space. Every game had its own booth. They all looked identical. Ours was really special because we built this physical thing. Um, and it kind of went on from there. Uh, the problem with this one was the IKEA wood is actually cardboard, so the wheels we put on there kept on breaking. So we decided we need a new one, and let's make mobility our priority so we can take it everywhere. So we made the baby cade which is, uh, looks kind of like this. Um, again, there's a young person having a blast. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> we, we couldn't get a, um, a, sh a shopping cart, so we ended up just buying the cheapest vintage baby stroller we could get. Um, this has been showcased several places, and we're, st we're hoping to bring it to parks and just drive it around downtown uh, with both our indie games and your indie games and whatever. Um, a bit later, I went to Global Game Jam in Antwerp, and I decided, which is my hometown, although I live in Copenhagen, I decided to bring part of this culture that I'm engaged with back home. Um, so again, I had no money, so I bought the cheapest vintage coffee table I could find. I put a screen in it, and I brought it um, and played some of the games that I play so often in Copenhagen. Um, that ended up, I ended up meeting exactly the right person who wanted to help me with this, took it forward, and we ended up making it into the Press X, which is a platform where we curate indie games and bring them to events. We've exhibited Proteus and Super Hexagon, uh, Tengami, and other games at uh, places that have never seen those types of games before, which is really awesome. And it's, this was made in January. We finished it in February, March, and it's been to like 10 different events, and it's going to be hopefully more and more. This is a beautiful... It turned into this beautiful thing with like we put like gold gold plate on there that says press X and it has like gold hooks for your Xbox controllers, really nice. Um, and then this one I actually I got invited to uh, to showcase a game at Wild Rumpus and I arrived a day early and that's a bit of all right conference and I arrived a day early and I decided well I don't really want to see London I'll just build an arcade so I got somebody I spent the whole day making phone calls again I had no money so I. Um, I got somebody to lug these pallets through downtown London with me on foot, uh, like a kilometer or two, and then ended up at the venue and just cut a hole in the top, put a screen in there. And again, I made this thing with very little effort that just completely dominated the space at the Bit of All Right conference and at Wild Rumpus. Um, so to sum up, what I'm trying to say is build arcades. It, it works out. It's great. It's great fun, and it's really rewarding. Um, use whatever you can find, bring them wherever you go, and organize meetings for them. Uh, basically, if you build them, if you build it, they will come. Um, so I wish I could tell you that I had some master plan where a year ago I decided to become a game installation artist. Um, I wish I could tell you it was super easy getting these projects funded and, and finding materials, et cetera, et cetera. I wish I could tell you there's never been any hammering or gluing or sawing mistakes. Um, I can't, but I can guarantee that these machines are a really good way to get your game to actually be played by people you otherwise have a difficult time reaching because they don't necessarily understand computers, uh, but they understand the shape of whatever it is you have there, or they understand that this is something interesting that they should pay attention to. It can also get you invited to a lot of cool parties like <laughs> GDC Europe. Um, <laughs> Uh, in our case, it won us our first award. I got here to come to GDC Europe and uh, sort of host a panel. Um, I really recommend it. The thing we started in Antwerp, I put a screen in a coffee table, and since then we've curated two entire exhibitions, and we've brought it to ten other events. Um, so to round us all off, I have no idea how I am on time. Um, why, it, why I think this matters uh, from a sort of higher point of view. These devices are 
the only gateway or every device is a gateway to the digital world inside. If you want your game to be played by humans, you have to make an interface to the physical world, um, which means you're giving it a physical shape. You m don't do this consciously when you make a computer game because the computer is your shape, but you totally have the power to put it in any other shape, and every shape is different. Um, using shapes that we're familiar with has really interesting consequences. The three crates, uh, pallets I put on top of each other were so sturdy, people were standing on them and dancing and sitting, and it was so makeshift, I was just gonna trash it, I wasn't gonna bring it back home. I handed out markers and duct tape for people to tag it and make it, you know, this sort of, old, you know, here, here today, gone tomorrow thing. Um, the Press X, on the other hand, became this beautiful ornament, like we ended up lacking it, so it's shiny and, and it's beautiful, and people just wanna go in there and be enthralled in the whatever magical, beautiful indie game we put on there. Um, so, and to, to connect it to the other things, events and showcases is where these installations come to fruition. The importance of, lo importance of local multiplayer games has been argued quite a lot in last years, you know, the Sports Friends Kickstarter and stuff like that. These events, they can provide the critical mass that those games need to make sense, both for players and spectators. Games like that often don't make any sense when you just play them like a four-player game with only three people and there's no spectators. That, that's not the same. And, um, to me, they are to games what movie nights are to movies or concerts are to music. Uh, it's a place where you come and you enjoy the games that are being curated or that you brought yourself with your friends. Um, then also at these events, interesting things happen where these concerts or movie nights overlap. This is Chipsol playing at the Waldrempus party in front of Super Hexagon, which is a super interesting combination of two forms of media. Um, same thing happened to the game I made, Go Nuts, uh, and DJ's wearing robot masks while we're trying to play it <laughs> on his body. Um, and that's all I had to say. Um, I hope you are inspired to start doing the same thing I have so I can bring my arcades to your parties. Um, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks for coming. This has been a great turn up, great opportunity. Uh, these are all the people I would like to thank and mention, et cetera. Thank you, Marie and Zoraida, and see you later. Questions? We'll meet us outside. There's one, there's one last thing. I almost forgot. Um, so uh, when I was, got invited to come to GDC, I thought it would be so cool if we could bring, or we thought it would be so cool if we could bring an arcade, but what's possible? So I booked my Air Berlin fare, and they said, you can bring one luggage. And I was like, well, I don't need a luggage. I just put some T-shirts in my hand luggage. But then I decided, why not build an arcade inside a suitcase? So we came up with the Luggatron, which you can see right here. And I'm going to be playing on it until they kick us out of this room. <laughs> but more interestingly, it'll be in the expo hall next to Sasa's amazing Achtung Arcade, which actually has a place in the expo hall until tomorrow afternoon. So please stop by, come play it, talk to me, or find me on the internet. Um, that's where I live. So thank you. Thank you.